A very good afternoon to you and it's great to have you on board this afternoon for our latest Nexus webinar which is looking at active health opportunities through the University of the Highlands and Islands. My name is Jaya Calder and I'm going to run the webinar for you this afternoon. Now before I pass over to my colleague Katrina to introduce our speakers this afternoon, just a quick reminder if you haven't already joined one of our webinars through GoTo, Although as an audience member you're automatically muted, we actively seek your engagement, your comments, your questions throughout the whole of the session. The best way to do that is you'll see a question box. Just pop in any questions, comments or whatever throughout the whole of the session and we'll pick up your questions at a Q&A at the end of the session. But if there's anything that we can't cover, we will come back to you. You'll also see what looks like a raised hand icon and if we have time during the Q&A then we're always happy to take someone off mute and ask your question direct to our speakers. And finally, we always record all of our webinars just to get maximum knowledge sharing. So thanks for listening to that quick intro and I'd like to pass on to Katrina. Thanks. Thank you, Jaya. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Nexus webinar. I'm Katrina and I work as part of the Northern Innovation Hub team at HIE in Inverness and I work alongside Andrea in the Life Science team. One of the projects that we work on is the Nexus webinar programme, which is a good opportunity to find out more about what is going on in our life science, health and technology communities and to make connections. As most of you probably already know, Nexus is our co-working space in Inverness campus where life science and technology companies work together and collaborate in the space. And funding comes um, from the Inverness City Region deal and European funding. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Trish Gorley, who is the senior lecturer at the University of Highlands and Islands, and also Daniel Crabtree, who is research fellow at the University of Highlands and Islands. And they'll both be discussing their active health project and telling us more about some of their research and what they're aiming to achieve. And they'll also demonstrate how their research can be used within the context of the health and well-being in the workplace. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Trish, who will um, start us off. Hi. Just waiting for the slides to come up. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm I'm Trish Gawley, and I'm just going to sort of start this part of the webinar off. Um, as, as Jaya just said, uh, we're going and Katrina, we're going to overview the big active health project at UHI uh, and what it is and what it's trying to achieve. Dan and I will introduce ourselves first, and then Dan is going to talk to a broad overview of the project. Then it'll come back to me and I'll talk about some of the research that we're doing and some of its applications into workplaces before we move into the Q&A section. So Dan wants to click the slide on. Uh, just by way of introduction to myself, I'm uh, Professor Trish Gawley. I've been working for too many years now in uh, the area of physical activity and health with a behavioral science focus. So looking at behaviour change, how we support people to change their behaviour to become more active, to become less sedentary, uh, and also do quite a lot of work in physical activity measurement, which is always a complex task. I've been with UHI since uh, 2015, uh, when we transitioned over as the Department of Nursing from the University of Stirling. Uh, prior to that, I was spent the majority of my career in a sports science department, both in England and in Australia and I've already said where my interests are and just to be clear I'm not Australian I'm a Kiwi just get that right up front to start with and then over to Dan. Hello so my name is Dr Daniel Crabtree I've worked with University of Highlands and Islands for the last three and a half years as a research fellow in physical activity and health. My background is sport exercise and health sciences and uh, I've got a BSc, MSc and, and PhD in that area. I've been working with the Active Health Exercise Lab as part of the Active Health Project since my arrival in 2015. And my main interests are around nutrition, energy balance, physical activity and exercise intervention. The Active Health Project is very much a multidisciplinary project and it's received funding from Highlands and Isles Enterprise who enabled me to, to come and join UHI and also 
city, city region deal as well. The project involves collaborators from within and, and out with UHI in the areas of, of rural health, physical activity, digital health, nutrition, biochemistry, and behavior change or, or psychology. And all of these individuals who work in these areas combine, try to combine their expertise to deliver projects which, which meet the active health objectives, which are essentially to improve the quality of an individual's life by facilitating health promoting lifestyles and thereby potentially reducing the burden on the NHS by reducing hospital readmissions. And we have really two main groups within active health. We have our prehabilitation group, which is led by, by Trish, and we have our rehabilitation group as well. And both of those aim towards proving prevention of injury or illness. And within the project, we, we collaborate with clinicians at NHS Highland and out with to try and deliver on, on these objectives. Myself, I spend most of my time as part of the Active Health Project in the Active Health Exercise Lab, which was opened in 2012. So this is a new facility for UHI, and it sits within the Division of Biomedical Sciences, where I'm also based at the Centre for Health Science. The picture on the, the left of the screen is, a, is an overview of the lab. It doesn't quite show everything, but within the lab, we're able to conduct a number of different types of assessment, all aimed at health-related outcomes. And we do this by utilising our equipment to measure cardiorespiratory fitness. And those individuals you'll see in the pictures with the masks on, they're undergoing what we call maximal uh, oxygen uptake or, or maximal exercise tests. And we have different versions of these. It doesn't have to be maximal. We can also conduct sub-maximal tests and tests without all this equipment uh, as well, of course. But this equipment enables us to measure a very high standard and in individuals' cardiorespiratory fitness. We're also able to conduct strength assessments and nutritional analysis, plus assess an individual's energy balance or, or energy metabolism, either during exercise or at rest. In addition to research, which is the primary aim of the lab, we've also been involved in public engagement activities. So you'll see on the bottom of the screen there, myself and a former member of the lab, Dr. David Muggeridge, conducting an exercise test on Graham Stewart, who is a professional triathlete and was involved in the Keltman uh, a couple of years ago. This was us on the BBC Scotland Adventure Show, which we were involved in in two episodes of that. This is the Active Health Exercise Lab. And as I explained, we're able to do different types of assessments in here, all health-related. Uh, cardiorespiratory fitness assessment, you see this with the individuals with the masks on and the treadmills and the bikes, strength assessment, nutrition and energy balance or metabolism. We've been involved in some public engagement and we're also we received approval shortly before lockdown to conduct commercial work whereby we would um, invite individuals in to have certain assessments conducted on a pay-per-use basis. And we're in talks with High Life Highland and other uh, fitness providers in the area about maybe partnering with them. The last slide I'll present before I hand over to Trish is the about the Life Sciences Innovation Centre that's currently in the planning stages. And within this, we'll have an active health section that will include the active health exercise lab. And it will also include the active health gym, along with a nutrition research kitchen and a blood processing lab as well. So that should hopefully, fingers crossed, open towards the end of 2022 and the lab will physically move, move over there. But I will hand over to Trish now who's going to start off by talking about our city region deal project. Trish. Thanks, Dan. So as part of the Active Health project, we have uh, a large number of studies going on in that loosely or in some way relate to active health. And they're all at different stages of development. The majority of studies that we do fall under the rehabilitation umbrella at the moment, where we're trying to work with clinical populations to help them recover from, for example, a cardiac event or to self-manage type 2 diabetes, something like that. Most of our projects will include an element of self-management and looking at different ways of facilitating that. Uh, central to the, uh, to the Active Health project was funding from the City Deal for five PhD students. These students are all part-time and they are NHS employees. Um, they, so they come out of clinic, their clinical role for half the week and they work in their clinical role the other half of the week. 
and that leading on the five projects that you see up here. So we have a, an NHS physiotherapist who is looking into digital self-management of chronic low back pain. They, I should have said that these projects, they are all chosen to address an identified clinical need by these people, by the students. So chronic low back pain is a really difficult issue for, to, for people to live with, for the people who um, experience it, and it's a difficult issue for treatment. And largely it revolves around asking people to self-manage their condition. And so this project is looking at how digital self-management can be best employed and who it works for and in what context. The second project, we have the lead nurse consultant for cancer, who is looking at how e-mountain bikes could be used to help get people back outdoors uh, and, and back into nature and whether this, the impact that this could have on their recovery pathway. In another study, we have a cardiac physiologist who is developing a high intensity interval training intervention, so a HIT intervention, for those of you who have heard that term before, uh, that would be home-based and would be for people living with heart failure. So her work is looking at, first of all, developing that HIT protocol, but then we'll look at how we can best deliver it and what mechanism we could deliver it in uh, so that people can complete it in their home, because obviously in the Highlands we're in a very dispersed population, and so we, we having people come into a central location for exercise is often not uh, possible. We have another nurse who is looking in uh, fatigue in patients with multiple sclerosis. Uh, fatigue is one of the biggest issues or that or barriers that people with multiple sclerosis talk about that they encounter feeling fatigue on day to day and this works looking at the development of a of a care pathway that's not non-drug related to so non-pharmacological -pharm to help people self-manage their fatigue and the fifth and final city deal phd project is being conducted by the nurse consultant for dementia and she's looking at the role now of technology and bringing the outdoor environment into the lives or the homes of people living with dementia in rural communities. It was going to be a slightly different project, but COVID has really changed what we can do or what she can do. So it's now probably going to head down the virtual access, so some sort of VR route or something like that, but it's at a very early stage of development. But the other five sort of central projects that are funded by City Deal for the project itself, but we have a number of other studies going on as well. Um, so this is a study that Dan and I are both involved in. It's looking at type 2 diabetes and physical activity. We know that physical activity brings really significant benefits to people who are living with, with type 2 diabetes. It helps in their glucose management and also brings the typical uh, mental health benefits that we would see uh, and it's useful in weight control. But we also know that many people with type 2 diabetes don't take part in physical activity and their participation rates are very low. So we're looking in this project to or look at different strategies to try and support people's self-management and to take up uh, more physical activity. We're using a web-based technology for this particular project. It's designed around in a collaboration with High Life Highland and their personal trainers and also with NHS Highland staff to develop a website to train the PTs to be better versed in what is required for people with type 2 diabetes, but also um, some more on behavior change. They then take this out into practice, work with our clients, uh, and we're looking at outcome measures around the effectiveness of the training, but also whether it impacts on people's behavior. So the another study, you'll be uh, highly aware, I should imagine, of all of the technology that we can now wear on our wrists or other parts of our body that monitor what we do. And these wearable monitors are very popular for people in terms of trying to change their behavior. Some of them are more accurate than others. And I think it's important that if we're going to use these devices and interventions, or even just for the general public, buying them off the shelf and using them for themselves, that we have some sense of how accurate they are. And the BBC News headline that you see there, this is from a study by Aberystwyth University, 
are looking at one of the Fitbits and they found it was pretty accurate for testing calories burned while you were running, but when it measured walking, it was overestimating by about 50%. So if people are using this for you know, their own self-monitoring, there's some, potentially some problems there. So we have a study going on at the moment where we had people wear a number of different devices and we had a gold standard one as well and we can comparing the output across these devices to get a sense of how accurate they are and it's an interesting study some of the devices or one lot of monitors were supplied to us from a company who wanted us to evaluate their particular device and get some independent feedback on it so that's one project we're doing under the banner of active health other work, this is work that I've been involved in in the past, looking specifically at workplace physical activity. And I thought I'd put it up today as a might be a point of interest to people, at different work sites. And we've done a bit of work over the years looking at the evaluation of workplace physical activity promotion programs. The most recent work has been looking at the effectiveness of Paths for All Step Count Challenge which if you've not heard of that, is an eight week challenge where people enter from their work sites in teams of five. They record their steps, they compete against other teams and it runs for eight weeks. And it's to see, you know, to encourage people to move more during the working day and their day in general. And we've been looking at that national program, uh, looking at data for the last five years to see what impact it actually has on people's physical activity. Probably of more interest is the work that we've been doing specifically with individual businesses around how they can help their staff overcome some of the barriers to physical activity. Uh, the largest one of those is time, what's the one everyone cites. And we've done research working with four companies looking at what would be the barriers or the motivators to actually incentivize their staff to do physical activity during the working day, actually giving them paid time to do physical activity. That was quite interesting. The biggest barrier actually during the working day seems to revolve around culture and what, what, what it means to be working. And although in, those, in that study we found staff and bosses alike saying, yeah, they value physical activity, they think it would be good for productivity, it would be good for absenteeism and things like that, they didn't actually do the physical activity during the working day because there was this real sense that if you're not at your desk, you're not working. Um, so people wouldn't leave their desk to go and, and do physical activity. Of course, all of that is changing now as we all work from home. And what does it actually mean now? How can we encourage? I think the big question now is how can we encourage our staff to stay active and not become more sedentary because all the evidence from the COVID restrictions would suggest that people are in fact more sedentary. They're sitting a lot more than they would have done when they were coming in to workplaces. And that's a concern going forward and probably something uh, as work sites and workplaces need to, to look at, uh, at addressing uh, going forward. So in terms of some of the application of the work that we doing i think there's something in incentivizing your workforce but that is going to need to take some effort to actually change people's perceptions of what's permissible and what's actually acceptable in a work site and making the support real for all employees and it does vary depending on the jobs that people have if you have a public facing job then you you can't just go at random intervals you might have to have your timetable slot for when you can do physical activity or whatever, but there's a real sense that it's not enough for managers simply to say it's okay. It there needs it needs to filter right down amongst the whole workforce and with real role models coming in uh, to support that. One of the big things I think through the working day isn't to move away from physical activity per se to look at what I would call incidental movement, and that's getting up and and just moving during the day. So we did a, a study where we actually took uh, people's printers away. It was in an office space where everybody had a printer on their desk and we put a centralized printer. We moved all the rubbish bins out of people's offices. So if they wanted to put something in the rubbish bin, they actually had to get up and go and put it into the rubbish bin. And we had a centralized water filter and those sorts of things. And it was about trying to encourage people 
to get up off this seat and move around. And it's quite simple environmental changes like that can make it a really big change. And the, the challenge at the moment is how do we translate that into the home working environment? And I'm just actually going to switch back to Dan now to talk about the life scan work. Thanks, Trish. Yeah, just very briefly, we did some public engagement with LifeScan last year in collaboration with their in-house nurse, myself, Kirsty Hickson, who's a registered dietitian and biochemist in the Active Health Exercise Lab, and Kasia, who subsequently went on to work, work for LifeScan. They both presented around nutrition and, and healthy diets and lifestyle. And I presented a, a, a presentation about, I think it was energy balance and, and exercise, so the effects of exercise on, on appetite control and, and energy balance. And that was all to the staff. We also conducted some voluntary cycling tests with the staff too to assess cycling power. Very short assessments and gave them gave them a little bit of feedback about that during the presentations. And there was hope that we could go forward and make this a more regular engagement with LifeScan. But unfortunately, then lockdown happened, and I think there's been some changes over there. So we'll see how that goes forward. But we have a little bit of experience with that, in a sense, not in a research setting, but more in, in public engagement. Really, it's a very quick overview of some of the research. We have a lot more research going on, right from the biomedical through to the behavioural with both healthy populations and uh, clinical populations. And it is really, really exciting times with the development of active health, and particularly as the building comes on stream and we have the lab and we actually have an exercise gym, the, the range of projects that we can do uh, and facilitate is going to increase all the time. And there's lots of chances and opportunities for innovation in the work that we do once with those facilities and also in the meantime while we're waiting for them. Um, so, and lots of potential for industry engagement as well to try and, you know, working together to support the development of ideas for self-management or for the measurement of physical activity or in some other way that would come in to, you know, assist in a two-way street, really, a two-way collaboration between research needs and, and industry needs. And I think we're just at that point, unless Dan's got something to say, we'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Trish and Dan. I think a few of us were listening to you saying that we're becoming less active as we're all sitting there thinking, yes, we are. So I gave an extra couple of rockers on my rocking chair there just to counteract that. To the audience, still time to put your questions in. And also, if you would like to put your question directly to Daniel and Trish by coming off mute, we really like your involvement. But so far, we've had a question that's come in that said, are you looking for engagement with companies? And if so, how should we contact the lab? So what sort of engagement would you be looking for? Well, we're, we're always interested in inquiries and possibilities of engagement, either in research projects or possibly student, master students placements and public engagement, like I explained with with LifeScan as well. The idea with the LifeScan public engagement was that we were to deliver presentations and go over and, and physically do those cycling tests on site with the kind of agreement or understanding that they would advertise our research studies and encourage some of their staff to participate in, in, our, in our research studies. And that worked really well. And the next stage of that was potentially to discuss with LifeScan management about conducting physical assessments or even body composition, like muscle mass, fat mass assessments with their with their staff to complement what they already have with their in-house nurse. We've got some experience in that area. We're always very happy to receive inquiries from companies. Uh, our business manager, Adam, usually helps us deal with, with those. And in terms of contacting the lab directly, it's probably better if you were to contact myself if it was an inquiry related to the exercise lab, but active health in general, either myself or, of course, Trish. Do you want to add anything to that, Trish? No, I think that summarises it. And perhaps going back to the physical activity monitoring study, again, there's an example of where a company has come to us and, and asked for some assistance evaluating a, a device, and we've included it within a research project. OK, thanks very much. Now, I'm delighted that a member of our audience has raised their hand, which means we're going to take them off mute because the whole aim of webinars is having this dialogue, having this engagement. That's where we both learn. So I'm going to come to Carol to take Carol off mute. Good afternoon, Carol. 
Hi, I'm quite interested in multiple things that you're talking about today. I just want to put a bit of background to what we're doing in terms of how we potentially we could support what you're doing and you could support what we're doing and the opportunities there. So uh, we are a small charity it's based in Glenurk and Strath Glass, so um, just west of um, Inverness, covering uh, Dromadrop as our main community area. And we have just in the process of setting up uh, um, an active, tra active travel hub, which will be based at the former Truth Information Centre. Alongside that, we do health walks. I'm just putting in an application for an e-bike project, which is a trial project. I'm very keen to look at how that can be used to engage people to become more active again. So, yeah, there's a lot of synergies with what you're doing and what we're doing. Just wondering if there's opportunities for you to use our community or test things in our community or, or if that's an opportunity at all. The Hub project will launch in March next year. We're actually opening the doors. And um, so the Hub will have uh, multiple. It will be a community hub as well as a transport hub and a tourism hub. So it's a long term project. Um, but the other things like our health walks are well established and we work very closely with the health walkers and we want to use those individuals to try getting them on back onto bikes and using e-bikes to do that. So we are looking at things in a kind of more rounded way. And the other thing we want to look at is um, impact on diet on people's well-being. We're just doing a survey at the moment in our community about the effects of COVID. Um, on our community's mental health. So a lot in there. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot in there, Carol, and it sounds sounds great. And I think, yeah, definite synergies that you know between the what you're trying to do at your, in the local area and what we've been doing sort of in our in the university. So I think it would be great to to talk more and see how we could you know help each other in, in that regard. Um, particularly with the, you know, there's obvious links with e-bike, looking at e-bikes, with the health walks, uh, and the mental health side of it is, has been increasingly important for a number of years now, but COVID has really brought home uh, the importance of uh, doing something to, to manage mental health as well. Um, and physical activity has been highlighted in that. It was the one thing we were allowed to continue to do when we were strictly locked down. Yeah. Uh, so. I, I, yeah, more power, more power to you for getting some some measures of that and looking at how it's affecting the community. So, I think yeah, we could we should talk again um, of what what those how those looks could could work or or how we could help each other. What we'll do is we'll share email addresses between you, and then you can potentially make contact after. Carol, thank you very much. It, it honestly makes a much better webinar when we hear from people in the audience. What I would like to do now is, the ne is highlight the next question, which is, how are you assessing behavioural factors to nudge or persuade those changes in behaviour? Because as we all know, it's hard to get started, but it's also really hard to keep going. So in a nutshell, how do we acquire good and keep good habits? If, if I knew the answer to that, I would have already retired to the Bahamas or, or, or something on, on the winnings. It's it's really difficult. You've got all of the individual differences that come into play. You have the context of people's lives uh, that, that changes things. And we definitely need to do something different to get people started from what we need to do to get help people maintain. So the strategies that will work to help people get started, and some of that might, might be nudging, uh, but nudging's not overly effective with physical activity because it's such a, an effortful behavior and it's something that people have to make a conscious decision to do for the rest of their their lives so in some of the other behavior change you get you get to a point uh where it's no longer a conscious decision to do it and for many people they will never get to there for physical activity so we know that to start with uh rewards the social supports, the social side, and actually not concentrating on physical activity, concentrating on the things that go alongside with it, that make it fun, that make it enjoyable. That's what will get people started. And actually the fun and enjoyment and that sense of uh, intrinsic achievement is what will largely help to keep people going. Selling health messages is a really difficult job. Um, and although as a health professional, I might want people to be doing physical activity to improve their health. Trying to sell physical activity for that reason is is a, a you're on a hiding to nothing. For for most people, uh, health is something they take for granted. 
uh, particularly young people, they're all superhumans. They, you know, if you're saying, well, you do this physical activity now, it's going to stop you having a heart attack when you're 45. You know, that's so far off in the future that it just is meaningless to them. Um, and, and even for many older people, it's not so much about disease states. It's about being able to do the things that they want to do. So playing with their grandkids, feeling that they can take their grandkids to the park and, you know, maybe knock a ball around or just be there with them. Those are the things that are important to, to people and, and they're the things that we need to tap into if we're going to keep people uh, involved in physical activity in the long term. If we're talking about reducing sitting, uh, that is more habitful uh, and that is more uh, amenable in some ways to slightly more subtle uh, approaches. Um, and changes in the environment will make a huge difference. So I'm guessing, I can't see any of you, the only person I can see at the moment is Dan, and I can see that Dan is sitting down. I know I'm sitting down. When I come to my office or when, when I'm teaching and I go into a lecture theatre, everybody comes in and sits down. So if we had done this webinar face-to-face, uh, -face, everyone would have come in and sat down, and that is because the environment drives us towards sitting down. And, and that's the acceptable thing to do when you go to a lecture or to a webinar. So there's a real need to, to change what we think or, or look at how a physical environment drives our behavior. So what can we do? What can you, what can your uh, employees do to change their physical environment where they work that would remind them to stand up every now and again or to do something standing up? So maybe every time they take a phone call, they do that standing up and the phone becomes a trigger uh, for standing up because you'll get health benefits and you'll get benefits from standing um, during your working day, even if you're not moving uh, that much while you're, while you're doing it. So I don't know if I've really answered the question. It, it's complicated and, and it's very inf influenced by different people in different contexts and, and different roles, but we have to keep finding out that one thing or two things that is really important to a person and that's what will motivate them. Thank you very much. Well, we've got three or four questions that we still have to have, but I think we'll come to a member of the audience again, because it's always good. I'm going to come to Kate. There we go. Have I Thank done you. it? Yes, you're fine. On you go. <laughs> hi, Jaya. Hi, Trish. Hi, Daniel. Um, yeah, my question, I was fascinating talk. My question is around your uh, research into uh, 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 the use of uh, VR, AR, alternative reality, virtual reality with uh, dementia patients. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. Um, 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 you know, I have experience of supporting a family member uh, who struggles with memory. And um, yeah, that you know, the going outside, absolutely fabulous. And the loss of services during COVID has been really quite, quite challenging. Um, and uh, every time we uh, show her FaceTime, uh, she's, she's, she finds it remarkable because she's just so amazed by it but can't work it herself and there is the challenge I think with anything to do with AR or VR I'm just wondering what your project is there and how that's going to work just having seen how difficult it is to get someone to engage with technology when they've not done that historically in their lives I think it will get easier as the population gets older but I was just interested to learn a little bit more about that please uh, th thanks Kate um that's actually a project by one of the PhD students, so, and it's quite early days yet, and I don't think that they have, they've not yet answered those sorts of questions. They're looking at, they, it was going to be a more face-to-face, uh, -face direct, actually taking people outdoors project, but of course that, you know, over the last eight months has not allowed any of that to progress. So this is a, a shift that's going on now towards looking at ways of bringing the outdoors indoors and we don't have the answers to your actual question at the moment um, that will be I guess what the project ultimately will start to uncover some of those strategies that can be used and and how people living with dementia can be supported to use technology and it may be that they need uh, family or carer support to get the technology up and running around them but then they get the benefits of that being there, if that makes sense. That's great. Thank you very much, Trish. That's a good response for Kate. And thanks to Kate for posing the question. Now, we've had a comment in 
which I'll share with the audience. Just a wee comment. As a previously um, sedentary person, I've been trying to commute to work from home by doing a hip or a dance class on YouTube. It has really helped me feel better and happier, even if it's just for 10 minutes. The more I do it, the more I want to do it. And thanks for your interesting talk. Brilliant. Well done. More yeah. power to you. More, more, <laughs> more power to you. Um, I, th I think those, that's what we're not asking people to make massive changes. It's making little changes that bring you some pleasure or enjoyment and that you can sustain. So well done. Next question. You've mentioned quite a lot of different partners. So what part does collaboration play in the success of this project? That's to both of you. I, I, it plays a pretty big part, doesn't it, Trish? I think we, in order to deliver these projects, um, a lot more they're becoming very multidisciplinary, particularly if you're looking to apply for funding for larger projects. You, you need to have those multidisciplinary elements, um, particularly if there's a large, large amount of external funding that you're looking to apply to for. And we're quite fortunate at UHI in that we have within within reach uh, a number of individuals in, in different different disciplines who we can call on. And we have some resources in the moment in terms of equipment and space, and, and we're, we're going to have even more in terms of dedication to the active health projects when we move to the, to the new building. So that's going to be really, really helpful. Plus, we're, we're right next to Rakemore Hospital, which serves the whole of the islands and islands. And, we're very fortunate in that respect because not, not not an awful lot of universities have direct access to the clinicians that we have access to, and we've been fortunate through City Region Deal to have some of them on secondment as well, which has been really helpful for us and helpful for them, and helps us try and understand how we can apply our research to, to practice. Do you, do you want to add anything to that? Trish? No, I, I think it. Certainly with the NHS collaboration is, is critical uh, when we're working with clinical populations because it's, research is always most effective when it addresses a, a clinical need. Uh, and so working closely with the NHS clinicians and staff, we're able to identify issues that need addressing. So the PhD I mentioned around the high intensity interval training for heart failure patients, that was identified because typically heart failure patients don't get uh, referred to cardiac rehab and if they do they don't go so we're looking and it was thought there's a need to provide something different for for this population they differ in demographic from those who have say a, a heart attack or something like that so uh, this project is working to to develop uh, a process a, a, some sort of rehab that will be effective for those with heart failure so it's addressing the clinical needs so those that initial health university, NHS and university collaboration is really important, but then equally we need collaboration into industries uh, because we're not, uh, we, we, we're not IT people, we, we, not, we can't develop, there's some technologies we can't develop, so we can work with industry to, you know, for them to work with us to develop any technologies that we may need or that uh, an industry might come to us and say, hey, we've got this good idea, what do you think? and we can work with them and maybe uh, you know, become a bit of a test bed for, for that developing technology. Thank you very much. And the final question that I've had submitted in, looking forward, if we run the same webinar in six months and one year, what would you like to have achieved with the project? We would love to be in the building, um, any building other than my house. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, from the PhD students' perspective, we would like them to have been able to progress on um, through, obviously, through their PhDs. Some of them will be approaching completion in a year's time, or actually 18 months' time. Um, some have a, have a bit longer to go. So that side of it is is a really important deliverable for, for the project. I think we're constantly seeking money uh, as in grant money for to funding bigger projects um, and sort of doing getting to a point where our current feasibility and um, pilot studies we can get funding so that we're doing them on a, a on a bigger scale on a, on a full scale trials for some of the ideas that that we have 
And Dan's probably got some ideas for the lab. No, I totally agree with that. Uh, more money is always helpful. And it would be it would be good if we could have one or two large scale projects up and running involving multidisciplinary collaborations within UHI, also outside in terms of academia, but also from industry, industry, sorry, so that we can uh, we can put ourselves on the scene, if you like, and say that this is this is what we do and this is what we're capable of doing and really get our, our message out there through through these collaborations, research grants, working with industry, as Adam, Adam uh, our business manager, always tells me is, is the future. And that's that's going to be a play a big part in, in future grant applications that are going to enable, enable to do us, uh, for us to do the, the research that we want to do. And then in terms of doing the research, of course, uh, applying it then to practice. That's absolutely great. Thank you very much for that. And we've got more comments coming in saying, fantastic topic, keep up the good work. So I would just like to pass back to my colleague Katrina. Thanks. Hi, I'd just like to thank both Trish and Dan very much for that really interesting discussion. There was loads in there and it was great to hear more about the research that's been going on within active health, the variety of PhD topics that are being worked on at the moment and, and how the workplace, like people in the workplace can use the research that you've you've been working on to incentivize the staff it's all really really interesting and everyone who's been on the webinar today has really taken a lot from that and also thinking about positive habits i definitely yeah i was finding that really interesting but um thank you to you both for um for for presenting today and i'd just like to thank our audience as well for joining us and we're we're looking for your feedback so please do fill in the go to webinar feedback that will pop up when we finish the webinar today and do share the recording if you know that anyone would like to to hear further about active health also please do join us on the 10th of december for our final webinar of the series before the christmas holidays where we're going to have Don, Rob and Karen McKillop talking about NHS Near Me and BadgerNet, which is the electronic maternity record that has evolved and it is being used across NHS Highland. So that'll be another really interesting webinar to tune into. Um, so keep an eye out for our email invite and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and have a good day. Bye bye now.